So good evening, thank you very much for having me here. Um, I'm Pete Hill, I'm VP of Corporate Development at Kudos. Uh, and Kudos is a blockchain that provides access to this global, scalable, distributed computing. So we'll go a little bit into that a bit later. Uh, but very much on theme for what we've been talking about tonight, because we've talked about infrastructure through Space Chain, uh, you know, a different angle for that. And Evan, we're going to talk about running the validator of Kudos in space as well. Um, but the key thing here I want to kind of get across is actually kind of bring in two technologies together. So just a quick, uh, and those two technologies are blockchain and cloud, by the way, so... Uh, just for clarity. So, quick round of hands. I think most people in here are Web3, but are there any actual space people apart from yourself? <laughs> Two space people. Okay, all right. Slight disclaimer, I've been trying to remember these facts all day, because I thought, it's not very often I get invited to talk about space, and, you know, by no stretch of the imagination am I an expert, but I do enjoy it, and, you know, everyone's an enthusiast in the cosmos. I'm going to see Brian Cox this month as well. Yeah, very excited. Um, but, um, yeah, a bit like the real space. A lot of empty space in there, so um, I'm trying to wait for those to come together so I can get them across to you. Next slide, please. Thank you. So, uh, well, I'm going to say this, actually. This, you're going to think, well, this is completely irrelevant to start with. But 375 million, any guesses what that number is? So that is the amount of job losses uh, to automation that's expected by 2030. Um, out of 375 million, I mean, that's about 8% of the adult population, or probably over 10% if you consider the employed adult population. So it's a big number, and 36 million or something around of those is going to be lost to AI alone. But machines are going to be creating 58 million new jobs. So the point I'm trying to get across here is that humans find a way to evolve, and we're doing that via technology. And so we're seeing all these new industries come through, including space, what we're talking about here. Yes, it's established, but in, in terms of digitizing it, like Grant said, hasn't really been done yet. So there's huge opportunity here. And um, that's what we're all here today. So next, next slide, please. So uh, I'm not going to dwell on this because everyone here is clearly web free, apart from two people in space. So we, we, we could always catch up afterwards. But I really want to kind of talk about the fundamental building blocks of web three and what makes an open, successful ecosystem, or gives the best chance for that, at least anyway. So where's, where's my button pusher? He's just disappeared. Oscar, come back. <laughs> right. So when we talk about Web3, we're not talking about cryptocurrency, we're not talking about blockchain, we're not talking about metaverse. Web3 is that kind of overarching term, if you like, that encompasses all of that. So it's trustless, it's the, 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 the trust is in the code, right? So um, we don't need to rely on Facebook or Google or, or Twitter, one of those big tech companies, to do the right thing, and we don't have to fear about them doing the wrong thing either, because it's all predetermined in the code. And that code, if anyone wants to make major updates to it, it has to be voted in. There's a governance to it, uh, and that's where the community comes in on the next piece. Permissionless, you know, we're creating an open permissionless ecosystem where anyone can contribute and use it um, and develop on that as well. And decentralized, I think we all know the kind of the, the meaning behind that in making sure that everyone's got ownership of it. So it levels the playing field across the board as well. And that kind of leads into the ownership economy. So, you know, I've talked about this before and I just want to raise it now, but there's been kind of, if we look at the creator economy as an example, we started off with the likes of Facebook and MySpace, uh, MySpace, wow, that's a bit of a blast from the past. But anyway, so you could create your own profile picture, you could say who your favourite musician was, you could say what your marital status was if you wanted, but it wasn't really a way to monetize that. Then along came phase two with YouTube and Instagram and TikTok. I did tell you this was going to go off on tangent. And so uh, now you've got a way to monetize, right? If your if your content is good enough, then brilliant, right? You can make uh, you can make money from that. Then it went on to kind of direct monetization, so selling merchandise and uh, subscriptions and uh, tipping, etc. But bringing it up to today's uh, chat, the ownership economy is talking about NFTs, it's talking about cryptocurrency, it's talking about assets that you can earn and you can create and you can develop within ecosystems, but you can also realize the value outside. And that's the beauty of Web3. If you kind of bring those two together, then that's going to create a healthy ecosystem. So the third one is community, and that's key here, and it's key to every single person in this room, because decentralization means you need a community. The community are the ones that are going to be out there, they're going to be marketing this for you. They're going to be doing the social posts, they're going to be word of mouth, you know, they're also going to be the ones that are voting on key decisions, right? So you really need to build that community successfully, because they're the ones that govern the network and, and, and help it evolve. They're the ones that bring liquidity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you need all three of those elements, in my mind, to create a successful open ecosystem in Web3. Right, that's, that's the Web3 lesson over, by the way. Now, now we can go into that. Quick, quick question. On the ownership economy, is that, is that what you would say mean as the sharing economy? 
Uh, not so much. Well, it partly it comes into it. Yeah, it does partly come into it because now it's given everyone an opportunity to what they own, they're able to make the decision on what they do with that. Yeah. In, in that term, I was talking more about the crypto and NFT assets that so you're able to realise the value inside and outside. But yeah, you could extend it to to the hardware as well, which we're going to. So the reason I brought that up is because blockchains are very good for transactions. I mean, they are basically just a fancy spreadsheet that everyone's got the same copy of, right? So they're good for record keeping and to make sure that you know there's no double accounting, there's no manipulation, it drives greater efficiencies because you can cut out middlemen, but it doesn't scale computationally. And we're talking about space here. We're talking about big, big, big numbers. And all of that has got to be computed. And that's going to AWS, it's going to Google, and it's going to Microsoft. There's a Microsoft T-shirt in here. So, you know, um, you know, so it's going to these clouds, but there isn't a solution out there at the moment that's provided decentralized infrastructure, or at least highly distributed infrastructure. Uh, and that's the gap that we're trying to find, uh, fill. Uh, kudos is bringing the two together, blockchain and compute, and filling that last piece of the jigsaw. So I'm going to go on to a few kind of use cases in a second just to kind of change the, uh, the conversation flow. But anyway, first statement. There simply isn't enough computing power in the centralized model to cope with scale and demand. And that hasn't come from me, that's come from Intel. So Intel said that we need a thousand times the amount of compute that we've got today. And they're talking about the metaverse. They're talking about immersive internet. They're not talking about the universe. And the universe, I can guarantee you, is a lot bigger than metaverse is right now. Right? So it's expanded at something like 73 kilometers per second or 2 billion kilometers per year. And it's got a 13 and a half billion year head start on the metaverse. Right? So there's just so much data out there. I put it into context, but we need to find a new and alternative and scalable way um, that can uh, can make up that uh, additional compute that we need. So does anyone recognize this? Two space people in the room. Do you, <laughs> do you recognize this? Excellent. Can, can you tell us what it is? <laughs> Correct, it's Teresa. Uh, so, so this, this is a picture of Sagittarius A, which is the black hole at the center of the Milky Way galaxy. Now to take that picture, it took one week. It took eight different satellite telescopes dotted around the world to create a planet-wide satellite telescope. And they all collected three and a half petabytes of data to then reassemble it and create this image. Now that radio telescope was so accurate, it could have spotted half a donut on the moon. But this is obviously a lot longer and further away. Now this thing has the diameter of the Mercury of the, the orbit of Mercury, so it's four million masses of the sun, basically. But that's a tiny, tiny black hole, right? So we've got M87, which we found, which is 25,000 astronomical units across. Now an astro astronomical unit is 93 million miles, right? So this is 600 plus times the orbit of Pluto is just one black hole, and something like six and a half billion masses of the sun. So it's huge. But the point I'm making is that's just two things in our universe. So I'd be focused on things that we can't see because black holes are invisible, no light can escape. But anyway, we've got a photo of one there. That's just two things. Now, in our galaxy alone, we've got 100 billion stars. There's 100 billion galaxies. And whilst it's been theorized and not proved, there may even be 100, different, 100 billion different universes in the multiverse out there. I mean, there are plenty of Hollywood films that are saying it's real. So must be. How do we monetize this? Well, I think, I think Grant's done a really good job, uh, and you know, so has Evan as well, in you know, different ways that the space industry is finding to uh, create a new digital economy uh, of what has been happening you know, for the last 60 years plus. But if we want to collect, let's say we just want to collect one, one trillionth of that data, you know, what does that mean? What does it look like? So I'm going to use, I'm going to talk about two use cases. One is kind of Web3 and one is kind of more traditional, but it shows you know, why we need both technologies. So the first one is more kind of around the metaverse and digital twinning. So is everyone in this room familiar with what digital twinning is? Yeah, absolutely. So it's creating a virtual replication of something in the physical world. All right? So there's already blockchain games out there that have mapped the full planet Earth, and they're selling hexagons, and you can trade those hexagons, and there's different missions within those hexagons, and some of the money that you earn is going into treasuries and funding NGOs. So there's really, really kind of innovative stuff happening within the gaming space. So what now if we were to map this, our solar system, you know? And then I started thinking, now, I know I was born, well, James said, you know, my birthday was yesterday. I was born in 1984, and, you know, I'm quite happy that I had an analog childhood and a digital uh, adulthood, right? 
But I kind of often think, what if I was born today, and in 10 years' time at school, when this has all been invented, but it's actually matured, you know, I'm walking into class, and I sit down, and the teacher says, uh, we're going to go to Saturn today, and we're going to learn about the rings around Saturn. I mean, excuse my French, but how fucking cool would that be? So, you know, you get out your really thin virtual reality glasses, because obviously that's improved as well. It's not these heavy things. And you get on the, uh, the school spaceship, and warp speed, within a couple of seconds, you arrive at Saturn, and you're, you're going around, and they're saying, oh, look, you know, the, 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 the rings are made up of blocks of ice and dust, and some of those dust particles are centimeter big, and some of these are bolts. Right, it's just, it's just cool, right? That stuff kind of blows my mind. Or maybe we're all going to a PE lesson on the moon, where the gravity is six times less, and so these basketball nets are 50 foot high. And you can maybe even uh, you can go as an avatar of Michael Jordan or Bugs Bunny and pretend you're in Space Jam 3. Right? So it's just all these things. They sound really abstract, and Grant said the word abstract a few times. It's all going to come real. It's all going to come true. And, and I think this is kind of really engaging way and we're going to find so many more opportunities of what we can do with things like digital twinning it's uh, you know we haven't really scratched the surface the second one is a little bit more traditional okay but when i say traditional it's only 20 years old but it's still you know um something you would kind of more relate to standard cloud computer than necessarily than blockchain right now on the left hand side you know you've got the uk in june before the heat wave and on the right hand side you've got july during the heat wave and you can see the colour change. Now, th there's so much data that's being captured from space right now, from the, the low-line uh, orbital satellites beaming back down and that data and those images being put together and they're being sold to businesses that might be monitoring crop yield, plastic pollution, uh, soil erosion, whatever that might be. So, all of this data needs to be crunched together and of course, the more satellites we send up into space, the more data there is and this is going to be exponential as we, as we go deeper and further into space and technology gets uh, even more sophisticated. So we need scalable compute and we've already heard today about how we need blockchain as well. So it makes perfect sense to bring these two technologies together and it's something that just hasn't really been done yet at any kind of scale. And it's because it's still a nascent market, it's still new technologies, but that's the gap that we're, we're trying to fill at Kudos. Tokenization, I think there's been some great examples here, so you know, I'm not really going to dwell on this, but I think you know, there are different types of token. We're talking about NFTs, utility tokens, security tokens. You know, just the use Copernic space as the example here. Being able to earn, or own, should I say, uh, a little bit of payload, right? I'm sure half the people in this room have probably bought a gram before. What about a gram that's actually going to give you a return? <laughs> not just a cold the next morning, right? So, yeah. <laughs> what if we want to fund some kind of space vacuum cleaner, right, that goes and sucks all the debris out? Uh, or we're going to go mine asteroids, like you said, and by buying a, a, a part or helping fund, essentially, this equipment to go up in space by buying a fractional part of it, and you get the return on that from the mining revenues that are coming back. So, you know, there's absolutely a reason for tokenization within uh, what we're talking about here in the space industry. So that's it. We've come to an end. Another speech, another day. And uh, this is uh, just really to highlight what we're doing at Kudos and how we're doing it a little bit different. So we, we turned everything on its head and instead of doing an ICO in 2017, um, which we probably should have done, but you know, we didn't really know what we were doing then. We uh, decided to build a business that created uh, revenue. And so we started on the supply side and actually building a distributed global uh, supply base of hardware. Uh, we've got around about 50,000 nodes already, but those 50,000 nodes convert to about 300,000 teraflops of power, power at present, which actually puts us in the kind of top 10 supercomputers if we were to look at it in, in that way. Uh, and that just shows that the business model is it's more akin to kind of Airbnb. You know, we're not scaling our own infrastructure, we're scaling on other people. So professional service providers, uh, um, gamers, uh, GPU mining farms, etc., can, can contribute to the network and they can earn from networks. So, you know, what James said about the ownership economy, it kind of translates all the way down to the hardware as well. And that just means that we can get that global scale much quicker. And by the sounds of it, we can get the orbital scale as well with, uh, with a conversation with Evan. So, if anyone wants to know anything about, more about Kudos, we've got the team here. You can mint NFTs, you can build smart contracts on it. So it's a, it's a blockchain as 
Other blockchains are out there and you'll be familiar with that, but the real key USP is that it provides, it will be providing access to highly scalable global distributed compute. That's a mouthful. Uh, and that's me, that's Pete. Thank you very much.